I am so glad you are with me on this episode today because we're talking with Vanessa Hooks, a speech pathologist of over 10 years. She's a medical SLP. Her current setting and her favorite setting, I believe, is the inpatient rehabilitation center. And so we're going to talk with her about her stories as a medical SLP on an inpatient rehab team. We've got a bunch of questions lined up for her, and I know she's excited to share her stories with us. So you guys, welcome aboard, and we're going to welcome Vanessa as well. Hello, and welcome to the Missing Link for the SLPs podcast. I am so glad you are here. Today's episode is part of the Medical SLP series where we talk to some amazing speech paths who work in a variety of medical settings, all the way from intensive care through to home care and everything else in between and beyond. You're going to hear some incredible medical SLP stories and lots of advice from these passionate medical SLPs. So welcome, Vanessa. So glad you are here. You are our first inpatient rehab medical speech pathologist that we're talking to on this series. Oh, I did not know that. So lots of, I've got some questions lined up for you today. Tell us, though, first, why you became a speech pathologist. Oh. What's your story? Um, okay, my story. Um, I was a journalism major at oh. uh, Kentucky University, and I needed a job. So I was a patient care technician at an inpatient rehab facility um, all through undergrad. And I was working on my major at the time and I just loved doing what I did. And I was seeing all these patients like get better and go home. And I was so <laughs> intrigued. What were these therapists like doing with these patients that were changing their lives? So I shadowed a PT for one day and I was like, okay, this is not for me. I'm not trying to <laughs> break my back all day long. Not for me. And then I shadowed an OT and I made it two days with her. And I mm -hmm. thought this is a lot like what I do already. We were giving patients showers and that's kind of all I got from it. And then I shadowed a speech therapist and on day six, she's like, okay, I'm kind of done with you. <laughs> and I was like, I have, I have what I need. I'm changing my major. So um, I, that next week I went and met with my advisor and changed my, changed my major to speech pathology and, and the rest is history. And you've never looked back. No. <laughs> did you have a hard time deciding between medical SLP or school SLP setting, or did you always want to be a medical SLP? No, I always wanted to be a medical SLP. I think it's just from the experience that I had working in the inpatient rehab facility that I was at. That was kind of always been my guiding factor. Yeah. All right. So a lot of the um, listeners to this podcast are very, very new to speech pathology and they're not even sure what an inpatient rehabilitation speech pathologist does. Can you tell us what you do? What's part of your job? Okay, um, so can I tell you about my setting a little bit what, that sure. I work in? Okay, so my hospital is um, it's about a 250-bed facility. So it comprises of about 35, 37 inpatient rehabilitation beds. Um, we've got a lot of psychiatric beds as well. Geri psych, um, geriatric psych, if you don't know what that is, uh, adolescent psychiatric, adult, they're all inpatient. Inpatient just means that they're staying there overnight, many nights usually. Um, this is a big, this is a big setting for those yes. who don't know. This is a very big setting. Yes. Um, we also have a outpatient psychiatric um, area which they live at home and then they come in during the day for several hours for outpatient care um, for psychiatric services. And we are almost at the point where we're going to open up some outpatient rehab services as well. We have the area set up, ready to go. So um, that's new on the horizon. So um, our rehab unit, again, about 35 beds, I think now, um, so we take a plethora of neurogenic disorders. Um, I would say about 80% of my caseload is, is strokes. Um, new strokes, these are generally people who have had a stroke within five to seven days, sometimes three or four days. Um, we also treat other 
disorders, it just a range, um, Parkinson's, dementia, respiratory failure that leads to tracheostomies, um, lots of encephalopathy due to numerous, numerous reasons, traumatic brain injuries, brain cancer, um, anything like that. So um, we have very, very sick people and um, our job is to get them better so that they can go home and live their lives just like they were before all these terrible things happened. So before they came to see you as an inpatient rehab, where were they? What so, the yes, so they were in an acute hospital um, before they came to see me. And that's usually, um, they're usually there just a couple of days, you know, like generally three to seven days where the hospital can stabilize them and kind of um, evaluate them to say, okay, what are their needs now? Can their needs be met at home? Can their needs be met with home health or outpatient services? Or do they need more intensive therapies like inpatient rehabilitation? So if they need inpatient rehabilitation, we provide that. They have to meet certain criteria. And one of the criteria is they have to be able to tolerate about three hours of therapy a day. Not about. They have to tolerate three hours a day. And that's Not a common speech therapy. therapy home. Right. That's a combination of physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. All right. So they move from the acute care to the, if, and if they don't go from the, from the acute care, they can either come to you, they can go home with a variety of assistance. Yes. Excellent. So these are the different settings because this is, we're just starting this medical SLP series. So it's just important to where you fit in with your inpatient rehab. Absolutely. How long, how long do your patients typically stay? Oh, okay. So, um, you know, our really severe stroke patients um, generally stay about 25 to 28 days. Um, and that's unfortunately a lot dependent on their insurance provider, um, which is really sad because they're expecting us to get these really severe patients home independent in 25 mm -hmm. days. And a lot of times that's just not possible. Mm -hmm. um, but we do the best we can. Um, so unfortunately insurance does depict how long they get to stay at our facility, but we do insurance updates for many of them, um, that we try to, you know, tell the insurance, here's what we're doing. Here's how far they've come. Here's where we're trying to go to. And, you know, sometimes our doctor will have what's called one-on-ones with the insurance just to try to get the patients more time. If we can talk to the insurance and say, hey, we think if you give us another week, we can get them home or um, to assisted living or somewhere else. So, yeah. Do you see the same patients day after day or does your caseload shift around? Um, well, it, it does shift. Um, I have another full-time speech therapist that works with me and we have kind of have our own caseloads. So um, an average day for me or a full day for me is about six and a half hours of therapy. Um, so I see the same patients, um, every day for as long as they're at the hospital. Um, some days I have discharges, some days I have new admissions. So, um, it changes weekly for sure. <laughs> and sometimes daily. Um, and that's a, that's a big difference from, um, an acute inpatient rehab speech therapist to a skilled nursing facility speech therapist. We definitely have a rotating caseload. When does your day start and end? So my day usually starts about 7.30 in the morning. Um, I usually get to work around 7. And then I like to see my dysphagia patients at least a couple times a week during meals, just so I know that they're carrying over strategies that I'm teaching them in therapy um, so our breakfast time is 7.30, our lunch time is 12, and I usually like to kind of hit those meal times a couple of times a week. When does your day end? Usually we're done treating patients between 2.30, 3 o'clock. Um, it just depends on kind of how the day goes. We have, like I said, six and a half hours of therapy a day is a full day for us. Um, but then we also have lots of meetings, you know, you Everybody has meetings, so you have to include some of that time. Um, we have 
weekly, usually bi-weekly, interdisciplinary care meetings. We have rehab meetings, hospital meetings, meetings to have meetings. You know how they do. So um, <laughs> lots of meeting times. Um, and then, of course, documentation time takes up takes up some time, too. So um, I like to leave work by four. Do you work weekends, holidays? I really try to avoid working weekends. Um, but, you know, insurance does not see that, um, you know, patients are sick seven days a week. Mm-hmm. They're not sick five or six. They're six, seven days. So, um, you know, insurance does not believe in holidays. They don't. They want us to be treating a patient through holidays. So we work holidays. We work weekends, yes. We do have PRN staff. PRN means as needed, if you weren't aware. Um, so we have as needed speech therapists that are um, on on our role that we can just call. And usually they'll rotate one or two weekends a month and help us out. But um, certainly I've had my share. Of, it's my turn to fill in a weekend. And that's mm-hmm. just kind of how the, how the teamwork goes. <laughs> And is it just you and the one other speech pathologist? Yes. So it's me and one other full-time speech language pathologist. And then we just, as soon as we hit that six and a half hour marker, um, and we're both full on our caseloads, then we'll call another PRN speech therapist to come help us fill in the gaps. How has COVID affected you? Oh, well, COVID really has affected everybody, hasn't it? Um, yeah, so... It does take time to, um, number one, clean. Um, We have to clean and sanitize everything between patients, and that takes time. Um, COVID's affected me because one of my patients gave me COVID. So um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. that certainly was not fun. Uh, Our caseload's changed. You know, we have a lot of post-COVID patients now. And, you know, me and my director were looking at the numbers the other day, and their outcomes just have not been as successful as we've liked or hoped. Um, so those COVID patients are, are, can be really difficult patients to treat and, and to gain their independence again. It's, it's, it's been a learning, a learning curve with that group. What would, say, what would you say is your typical patient? What would be a typical patient therapy session? Um, well, all of our therapy sessions are generally 60 minutes. I have the recommendation whether or not they get 15 minutes or three hours. You know, I can treat them based upon their severity. Uh-huh. Um, there may be an aphasic patient that I feel can tolerate two hours of therapy today, a day, and, and I'm able to give that to them. Um, that's a nice thing that my facility has allowed me to do. Mm-hmm. Um uh, uh, I see a lot of um, cognitive linguistic decline for various reasons. Um, I would say there is no typical day because we have so much that we work with. Um, I would, in, a speech therapist is not a great title for kind of what we do in the medical study because we don't work with a whole lot of speech. Uh, we do some dysarthria therapy, sure, but we do a lot of um, cognitive therapy and a lot of dysphagia. So all of my colleagues in PT and OT call me the mind mouth therapist because we oh. deal with everything like from the neck up. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, you know, a typical day could be all cognitive therapy or it could be all dysphagia or a uh, it, there is no typical day for me. You just treat what you're given. Tell us about your, can you share with us a story of a typical stroke patient? Okay. So what I like to say to new grads and, and um, my graduate students, I always have a student with me. Always, always. If you've seen one stroke patient, you've seen one stroke patient because mm-hmm. every stroke is so different. Mm-hmm. If you've seen a left hemisphere, you've seen a left hemisphere. If you've seen a right, <laughs> you've only seen one. Um, so everybody presents so differently. Um, and I think that the really new speech therapists really have um, this kind of outlook on everything is very black and white because our, our book, really does a great job, all of our books, educating us on all these disorders and all these treatments. But when you get out in the real world, it is not black and white at all. It's, it's not, 
let's say, aphasia versus apraxia versus dysarthria. It's usually all of them. It's like a pinch of this, a handful of that, and a slather of this, you know. So be prepared to say, I don't think it's this or I don't think it's that. Just it's probably a little bit of everything. And you just treat the most severe to maybe the least severe. You kind of do what what is most functional for that patient. So is there a patient that comes to mind that was just particularly challenging for you? Challenging. Okay. Um, yes. I have I love challenging patients. I always mm-hmm. tell um the other therapists I work with, I want the train wrecks. I want the ones that just nobody else wants because I, I I just love the challenge. So um, I think one of my more challenging patients was um, a 50-year-old stroke patient. She had hemorrhagic stroke from an aneurysm. She was um, globally aphasic, very, very um, intelligent woman, uh, very, very well-to-do in the community, active. Um, so I was able to work with her at the hospital for about four weeks. I think the insurance gave us about a month. Um, and we were able to get some functional language in that time, and her comprehension was enough to kind of understand basic concepts. And uh, we were making such good progress that I was able to treat her um, on a private treatment basis for the next two and a half years. So I worked with her for two and a half years. And she, not not me, I didn't get her better. She really got herself better and I just helped her. But um, she was able to give a beautiful, eloquent speech at the Heart Ball um, about a year after we stopped therapies because she had regained really everything. She is back to normal. She is thriving in the community. And it was a challenge to take um, a patient from so severe and then just take them through every little step of the way to get them back reading and writing and understanding and expressing themselves and their safety awareness and thinking and their memory and you kind of have to take everything into into context and, and and work with it every day. So she's my huge success story. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds like a huge success story. Yeah. And to be able to follow her for that length of time. Oh, yes. It, it was a blessing, really. Like she helped me be a better therapist just as much as I helped her in her communication skills. Yeah, for sure. One of the things about being a medical speech pathologist, sometimes you get little snapshots of people's recovery. So when you first see them in the acute care setting, they present this way on the severity level. And when they come to inpatient, you might see them for a longer period of time and then maybe follow them to home health, private private pay, private page client, um, or, or home um, outpatient setting. So it's really a treat when you get to see somebody and work with them for a longer period of time and be the one that discharges them because they've met their goals. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And we became just dear friends, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've very much go out to eat together now and, you know, she's, she's my fast friend forever. So (laughs) what has been a challenging working in the inpatient rehabilitation setting? Oh, um, challenges. I would say one of the biggest challenges is um, insurance. I would say having the ability to keep a patient for the time that we want to keep them. Mm-hmm. It's always a fight um, with insurance. Um, I, you know, that, that can be said the opposite way. Sometimes there are patients who are like, okay, they're good. Let's get them. <laughs> let's get them home. They, you can go, and then they don't want to go. They want to stay, and you know that. But more so than often, it's we want to keep them. We want to we want to keep them for longer, but we they have to go, and they're not ready to go. And so we, you know the next stage in the process. If they can't go home, they got to go somewhere. So we send them to a skilled nursing facility, which you know they're still going to get five days of therapy, and and that's what they need at the time. But our goal is to get people home. Um, And we take that very seriously as a team. What has been one of your rewards working in that setting? So I would say that um, 
I get to see people get better. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. You know, I've worked in every other setting known to man. Um, I worked in skilled nursing facilities um, for years. And, you know, you get to see your residents decline every day. And that's just part of life and the aging process. And there's certainly a speech therapist needed in that setting. Um, but I don't have to deal with death and dying issues, generally mm -hmm. speaking. I get to deal with, let's get you better. Let's get you home. And there's a lot of hope in that. And that makes me feel good to see quality of life change, to see that every day. That's what keeps me in the setting I've, I've been for over a decade now. So, Do you have any favorite resources that you use in your setting? Um, favorite resources. Let's see. I love using Constant Therapy app on the iPad. Um, I love, we use fees where we're at. So I love just having that visualization for patients to look and get that feedback as to here's what we're trying to fix. Um, that helps kind of draw the connection between um, what I'm trying to teach them and what they're seeing. Um, what is fees for those who don't know? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. These is an acronym for fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. So it is our um, standardized assessment to how we assess their swallow in the hospital. So we don't send them to, um, we don't have x-ray at our inpatient rehab facility. We don't have the ability to do a modified barium swallow study. So we use um, a, a endoscope to evaluate their swallow. Following up on that one, are you the one that does the fees? Yes. Um, I, we have a company that contracts. We don't have the equipment, but um, they have trained me. And so I am a certified endoscopist as well. That's neat. Um, I know when I practice in an inpatient setting, we did the modifieds and I did not do the fees. So it's neat that you can do the standard cognitive aphasia, dysarthria, and the fees. Yes. Yes, we do have that ability. That's very, very nice. Um, as far as other kind of therapy stuff that we use, um, we usually use the SCAT-B, the Skills of Cognitive Ability and Traumatic Brain Injury. We use that for our TBI patients. We use the Boston uh, for our phasic patients. We use the Arizona Battery for Communication Disorders of Dementia for our DD, just yeah. aging. Of course, we do fees for, for dysphagia. We use a, a, the apraxia rating scale for our apraxia patients. And we usually use the Newcastle dysarthria assessment tool to, to assess dysarthria or kind of scale it. Any words of advice for the new speech pathologist? I have so much advice. <laughs> I probably give my students. Well, advice. You must, <laughs> since you have so many students that, that follow you. That you uh, um, I have a couple of pieces of, uh, pieces of advice. I would say, um, I would say the first thing is know your worth. You know, know that um, we all have worked incredibly hard to get master's degrees. And a large portion of us, you know, have taken out really hefty loans. Um, and so it costs a lot to get a, a postgraduate degree. So um, know what the going rate for a speech language pathologist is in your setting and in your specific area. Um, when a speech language pathologist takes a really low ball offer, it affects the whole job market. Um Know, know your worth and ask for extras. You know, hospitals, contract therapy companies, they make millions of dollars off what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's never wrong to ask for extras. And when I say extras, it's things like uh, a sign-on bonus. Ask for, um, ask for them to pay your ASHA dues. Ask for them to give you CEU money. Ask for relocation fees. Ask for them to compensate you for various certifications that you want to get, like Vital STEM or LSVT. Um, what's the worst thing that they could say? You know, no, well, ask for it, you know. Or ask them uh, to pay for your fees training. Ask for them to pay for that. Ask for them to give you a raise once you get your C's um, and get everything in writing. So um, make sure you know your worth and, and, 
that's kind of important. Yeah. So Vanessa, I know you have some good experience with students and clinical fellows. Do you have a good CF story you want to share with us? Yes, I have a couple, but I will share this one because I will never forget it. And you may learn from this. So I um, took my first job out of grad school at a skilled nursing facility. And I was working with a patient. Her name was Marianne. I'll never forget her. Um, I was working with her during uh, breakfast and I was sitting face to face with her and she was recently put on nectar thick and liquids. And so I was trying to talk her into drinking some nectar thick and milk. And mm -hmm. <laughs> she would take the cup and put it to her mouth. She would take a sip of it and she would just spit it right back in the cup. And she's just saying this is nasty. And of course, I'm the new newbie in town, had no idea what I was getting myself into and said, oh, it's the same thing. It tastes the same. It's just a texture and trying to educate her on, you know, why she needed nectar thick and liquids. And she proceeded to take the cup and she said, then you drink it. And she threw it in my face. Oh, <laughs> Backwash and oh. everything. <laughs> So I think I pushed a little too hard. <laughs> yes. How would you have done that differently? How would, if that happened to us in front of her. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, when I have somebody who's on nectar thick, I, I, I haven't had it dumped on me or thrown in my face, but I try to say, oh, this is like a milkshake. Yeah. <laughs> You said you had two stories, though. You want to share the second one with us? Oh, oh my gosh, yes. So, um, so I was also very, very new, and I had a very dense stroke patient came in, and he was a preacher at a local Baptist church. And I went in there with my Boston. I knew he had aphasia. That was from the the history that I got. So I was ready to go see my first aphasia patient. I was so excited. And I walked in the room and his wife was in there and I introduced myself. And the only word that he could get out was the F-bomb. That was it. Mm. Every, to, an, to every answer, F-bomb, F-bomb, F-bomb. He was very embarrassed some of the time. Some of the time he didn't understand. Um, and his wife just was in tears. Just, you know, the wife of the preacher. So... Um, I remember going back to my desk and thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do with him? I, I did so much research. And, What's but, that called? Well, he had he had global aphasia, really, but um, definitely broke his aphasia. Was <laughs> no, but there's there's the disorder um, when they swear. Oh, yes. Um, oh, what is the name of that? I can't think of the name of that. But yes. Over and over again. So start my therapy. In a minute, so we're gonna we're gonna pause it for just a sec. Perseverating a lot. So, so <laughs> here's here's the homework assignment for the for the listeners. <laughs> Neither you nor I can come up with it off the top of our head. Um, so somebody look it up and please send it to freshslp.com and we'll put it on another on another podcast. So so what eventually happened with this gentleman? Well, the next day I went in. And on the door, his wife had posted a sign that said, no parishioners allowed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was like, that's probably a good idea. But um, he actually fared very well in therapy and he was able to, um, he was able to communicate with a um, communication board by the time he left and had some two word utterances, but his comprehension had greatly increased. So he was a, a success story because he was not saying that for everything. Although there were some F-bombs thrown in there. <laughs> yeah. But um, that was an interesting one. Oh, that's, yeah. I, and I'm like you, I like the challenging. Oh yeah. There's yeah, so much to work on and, uh, and sometimes they're so rewarding. For sure. Absolutely. I would say it's also important to, Always get your um, always get your patients say in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know what you want to do, but may they may not want to do that. You know, mm -hmm. I've had to change my plan of care so many times because they don't want to work on something that I feel like they need to work on. 
So, um, you know, it's important to communicate that with your patient when you're setting those goals. Here's these goals that I've set for you. Do you agree with them or what do you want to work on or what's affecting your life in the most, you know, meaningful way? You know, um, I have an example of um, I had a patient last year and she was in a car accident, young woman. She was internally decapitated and it caused a lot of issues with her swallowing. Mm -hmm. Um, She had bilateral vocal fold paralysis and, you know, she wanted to work with her swallowing, even though it's probably not going to happen for her. Um, But we were able to, um, you know, get a fee. She was a consistent aspirator, uh, but we allowed her to eat. Um, And if there's one thing that my students will take from me, it's they know those three pillars of aspiration pneumonia. And, and, you know, if, if you're healthy, um, you know, your body is probably going to be able to fight it off if you've got a clean mouth. So, um, you know, the recommendations were no NPO. That means nothing by mouth. You shouldn't eat. But, you know, we gave her quality of life and we trained her in a way that she was safe to eat. So that was hugely important for her and her quality of life. So clarify the three pillars. The three pillars are aspiration pneumonia, which is what we want to prevent, mm-hmm. uh, when we're working with dysphagia patients is there are three things that have to be in place for aspiration pneumonia to occur. And they are usually the, the oral cavity is filled with bacteria, you know, especially Mm -hmm. when you're you're in the hospital and you're not getting good oral care, that's a big deal. So we are big, big, big proponents for really thorough oral care. Number two. So you've got to have clean mouth. Number two, you have to have some sort of dysphagia or the swallow has to be impaired at some level. And number three, the body, the immune system is compromised. If the immune system is compromised, then it allows bacteria to um, settle in your lungs and you get pneumonia. So um, if you're healthy, if your mouth is clean, but maybe your swallow isn't normal, you still will not get aspiration pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So we feed those patients. That's a little bonus dysphagia lesson there. Yes. (laughs) Really good. That was very good. So, all right, Vanessa, last question. Tell us a little bit about other members on your um, interprofessional team. Who who else do you work with in that setting? Sure. Um, So we we have obviously the physical therapist and occupational therapist, um, and we all are in the same area. Um, And then we also... Um, have our rehab physician. Um, we have the respiratory therapist, the dietitian, um, the psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, we also have music therapy um, in the hospital as well. Um, I don't think I missed anybody, but every once or twice a week, we meet as an interdisciplinary team and we care plan these patients, which means we just talk about where the patient is, the progress they've made, any barriers they have to going home, medication changes that might need to be made, maybe environmental changes in the home that they need a ramp built or something like that. Um, So we just talk about every single patient individually as a team. No one person's job is more important than another. It really takes a village to get these patients better and home. So we discuss every aspect of their care during our care plan meetings. And share what works for you. For example, the physical therapist may be having struggles because your client, is, your patient is has some receptive aphasia. So then you share with the PT ways, the PT. Yeah. 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 Just That's instrumental. True. Yeah. All right. Um, we are working on, on a word cloud at Fresh SLP. Can you provide me with one or two words that you think define an attribute of a speech pathologist? I would say flexible and um, smart. If you're not smart, you're going to have a hard time. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today. Appreciate your stories and your your time and your words of advice. You're so welcome. Good luck to everybody. I hope 
hope today's conversation has created some aha moments for you and motivated you to become a better SLP. Continuing to connect some of those missing links between what you know and how to use that knowledge. Thank you for downloading the missing link for SLP's podcast. And if you enjoyed the show, I'd love you to subscribe, rate it, and leave a short review. Also, please share an episode with a friend. Together, we can raise awareness and help more SLPs find and connect those missing links and get the information needed to help them feel confident in their patient care every step of the way. Follow me on Instagram and join the Fresh SLP community on Facebook. Show notes are always available, so come learn more at freshslp.com. Let's make those connections. You got this.